So I do outreach. I am the planetarium director. And um, I'm trying to engage the public in many different ways. And one of the ways that I like to engage my own classes is we watch videos in class. Um, so we'll start something off, whether it's a funny video about what's going on um, that week, or there's some really cool space videos of the International Space Station flying over, or whatever the sorts of, it's inspirational, it's interesting. Um, and then Paul and I were just chatting one day, and we were thinking, it's like, well, he was like, well, what do you about this podcast? Because he does this whole Ask a Spaceman podcast that he's been doing. And we were thinking, it's like, well, what can we do to engage people in sort of the ways where we take some, something current and explain it in a way that they can understand, but also keep it at sort of the, the YouTube generation length. So we figured sort of two minutes was as much as we could get, and we'd pick something that was currently in the news that week or something that's really interesting to us. Um, so like when Pluto was coming around, we did a couple Pluto things, but we figured two minutes, um, completely unscripted. We'd interrupt each other, we'd have sort of something that's humorous, somewhat jokey. We have an excellent person to edit our videos. Um, thank you, Doug. Um, and just sort of have it off the cuff, and when two minutes is up, it's over. Whether we're mid-sentence, mid-word, or whatever. And so it's the sort of thing, if they want to know more, then we provide links um, beyond that. So that they, if they choose to dig in, they can. But if they've already spent their time, like, that was cool, I understand enough, the pretty pictures, they can continue on and move forward. And that was sort of our interest um, in getting this started. So how do you choose topics? Um, how do we choose topics? Well, we sort of just thumb through weekly news, um, whether that's NASA press releases, NASA press releases, cool Hubble pictures that popped up in the, in the popular press, anything that sort of catches our interest, um, current missions that are going on or a current launch, maybe explaining some more detail, giving some background as to why, why do we want to go to Pluto or why do we want to study these star clusters, those sorts of things. And it's sort of, we, we just trade off with um, Paul, myself, and Anna, um, they're both postdocs over in the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, and we just sort of trade off of who's interrupting and who's picking the topic and who's picking the pictures. What kind of feedback have you gotten from other folks? Um, actually, I haven't been paying attention to it quite as much. Paul, Paul usually pays more attention to that, but we've had um, a reasonable amount of people that watch our videos. Um, they're sort of in the hundreds um, for some of them, and that's not bad for just starting out and not not really pushing it real hard beyond sort of just our own social media networks. Um, one of the things I want to do is start maybe getting some classes involved with how they um, can watch a two minute clip and that might spark a small discussion at the beginning of class where, okay, what do we know about this? How does that relate to what we're studying in class? Um, and so that's some way of sort of adding some more enrichment into what we see in some of our courses. What questions would you have for Wayne uh, that you uh, didn't get a chance to ask the teacher? On your on your your stuff, your post office on YouTube, right? Mm -hmm. Do you do you use the analytics to do any analysis about who's what? We do in our college at Fisher. We do these two and a half minute videos, and we found that you're shooting that two minute thing. Mm -hmm. Our dropout point is between one minute and fifty three mm -hmm. seconds and one minute fifty eight, and that's the average time people watch us. So it sounds like, but do you look at those analytics and say when are people? Check it out. I have not yet, but that is um, something that we do want to do is go back through and see as we've done it, especially with some of our co-hosts and people that we bring in, look at topics that people find interesting. Um, and then also look at um, maybe some of the interactions in some of those videos where they do watch through and find something that's in common. But I have not spent the time to do that yet. But that's something that... Maybe we could uh, take a little break, and um, I know you guys have uh, some stuff that you want to bring up uh, before the end, and that may spark some other uh, questions. So uh, over to the ODEE team. Yeah. Well, I, I think we just came, and, and Corey had mentioned he's on vacation, which doesn't seem right, but uh, and we're all here. Um, but I, I just essentially kind of wanted to plug iTunes U as another potential source for uh, creating a podcast list out of, out of a course. So iTunes U has the same kind of functionality to create um, RSS feeds and, and kind of create 
podcasts and again kind of another easy way to distribute content to students and kind of a, a public audience as well. So, um, um, yeah, just about iTunes U, um, there are actually two options. You can create um, a, what's called a collection, which is more of a traditional podcast format, or a course, um, which can both link to audio and house audio as well. The difference is the collection does um, work with an RSS feed. The collection is going to be primarily used for browsing podcast style. But if you have something, for instance, you have a series of audio files and sound files that you want to use, but you also have some other media like um, handouts or web links, or you're trying to create something that's a little bit bigger of an experience or that incorporates different types of media, the other option would be to, um, to actually just build a course that's going to house it. In terms of the process for creating those, they're very, they're very easy, very similar. Um, it can be a matter of inserting links or in the case of a course, um, dragging and dropping files as well. Um, if you're interested in either of those, you can definitely go to our resource center and read all about it. Um, quick way to hop there is go.osu.edu slash iTunes U. Um, and if you're interested in more information, we'll have an informational session coming up. If you can check in on our workshops website, um, or you can always email me. Um, I'm poker.13. Maybe one other interesting thing to throw out there is that uh, we've talked today about informal learning, things like that. That doesn't mean that something that is produced for a course couldn't be used in a sort of similar way, especially if you're going to you know, promote a particular class. Um, and so there is some potential for overlap, right? If you've got maybe an introductory course that in your area that would maybe benefit from more people knowing about it if it doesn't happen to be G, a GE course or something like that. So that stuff happens as well, and you can spin off different parts of it. That's the beauty of being able to edit all this stuff so finely. Well, I, th I think that would kind of be the other place where we might suggest, you know, if you're looking for creative ways to create assessments for students or assignments, podcasts, you know, in lieu of a discussion board or to supplement a discussion board, podcasting can be a really great tool. And I know we're, we're looking at a Canvas pilot right now a few of our courses and as that goes on there's functionality within that particular LMS where students can kind of create podcasts on the spot and, and kind of submit that you could students could do that as well in the discussion board in Carmen right now attaching that file and recording that way but but podcasts are you know and in fact Byron I know he and, and Corey and Nicole created a podcast last quarter and our semester in a in a in a course they were working on. It was their big course project for the term. Was they kind of cataloged over the course of the term after each class lessons and takeaways they were learning and kind of also then brought other material into uh, that format. And so they kind of had a running dialogue and it was just this podcast series. And I think they continued and Byron has continued it with the EdTech.fm out of what, what sprung out of a class. So I think there's, you know, and the other interesting thing for that, or, or if students want to start to post that to SoundCloud or something like that, now they have work that's coming out of a class that is reaching beyond just the, the confines of, of that course and is starting to become public scholarship. So I think there are interesting ways to use these kind of tools, not just from the instructor side, but to create opportunities for, for students as well. We do um, YouTube videos in my course, and basically instead of a term paper, they work in a group or basically a group of one to four people. It's up to them because there's always a few people that want to work alone. Um, but they pick a topic that's in the course, they do some more research on it, and they make a video. Whether that's teaching that topic to their classmates, or whether it's exploring it in a different way, and some of the ideas that they come up with to, in order to explain things, I could never come up with in a million years. So it teaches, gives me resources to then use in future semesters to also teach um, when I do that. But if you've ever thought about explaining why Pluto isn't a planet with puppies and kittens, <laughs> they succeeded very, very well. And maybe uh, a nice way to end this is, uh, or just is, I 
think it would be nice to see some of the stuff in action. And uh, the easiest way to see it is to show uh, their video. So, three, two, one, space in your face. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Nuremberg. And I'm Wayne Schlingman. Anna. What's in your face this week? This week, I want to wish happy birthday to HD100546. Happy birthday! Yay! How old is this star? Just 10 million years old. Just 10 million? That seems like it's really old. Well, no, it's not. That's actually a really short time scale if you're thinking about star formation. Okay, okay. So, for example, our sun is 4.5 billion years old. Now, that is a lot older than that yeah, star. Yeah, that's okay. almost a thousand times older. Wow. And another time scale you can think about is the dinosaurs lived on Earth 65 million years ago. Whoa, so this star wasn't even born when the dinosaurs were here. Right, they would have okay. looked with their dinosaur telescopes and they wouldn't have seen anything. That's awesome. Suckers. That's awesome. Good thing that the dinosaurs aren't here anymore. Yeah. Because they'd be disappointed. Or they'd be really happy because they're going to be happy. a star to see. Okay, okay. Anyway, so this is the star field around this star. It's just that little speck in the center. Just a tiny little speck. And then we can zoom in. This is a Hubble image of the disk around the star. Okay, so what is this disk around the star? So young stars have this disk, which is where the planets are actually forming. Okay, so it's forming planets. So it's forming a solar system. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So this little orange spot is a labeling a point where we think a, a young planet is orbiting around the star. Okay, that's very cool. And what's really interesting is that recently, scientists looked at the gas dynamics of how the gas is moving around the star. Okay, and they, so they're watching the gas move. Yeah. And, and what does it tell them? They think that the planet is actually sweeping gas into the star. And oh, so it's it. like it's feeding the star and building it up. Yeah. Okay, exactly. so that means that the star is getting bigger and bigger just due to this planet. A little bit, yeah, definitely. So how big is this planet or this star? The star is twice as massive as our sun. It's oh, going to be big. It's going to be really bright, and the planet is about five times the mass of Jupiter. Um, there's a, perhaps a model. And for getting students involved, I think um, giving them something that's short because they don't have to get into too much detail or they have to choose which details are there. Um, but it also gives you a chance if you have to give feedback for anything. Um, that's the other reason why I chose to do videos rather than papers is I can grade the videos in five hours. <laughs> 50 videos, that's doable. 50 papers, not in five hours. <laughs> yeah, I like this. So I'm going to speak for Patrick because he actually tried to implement a podcast versus paper method for a final project in his class. And he was telling me about this, right? And so it's like either for this final project, you can turn in your final 10 page paper or a five minute podcast. Guess how many people chose to do the podcast? Just like all? I have an all? Anybody else? Zero. Zero. So here's the thing. I think this is like really important to kind of remember. And this is, you should force people to do this. They're not going to think they can. I think. At least this is something that I've heard. I mean, some students are really tech savvy and probably would take that on. But at least in the humanities, you're so used to writing papers, that seems like the easiest thing, right? And it seems like the most manageable kind of thing. So I think that making that a mandatory thing, I'm sure there are people who are like, how am I going to make a video? Even if it's they only freak that out. long, they freak out. Everybody, like that's the thing, was like students will freak out, but I think it's worthwhile. But usually they freak out for the first four weeks. And then, they and then all of a sudden they're yeah. like, well, I sat down with iMovie and I just spent two hours with it and this is going to be so easy. Mm -hmm. And it's just this total flip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think that making it like mandatory is like great idea because otherwise nobody will do it. So. Well, it's become a modern skill, right? That's how we communicate is with video. So for them, it's also practicing business skills.